We are talking about Jethro Tull tonight because they are going to be releasing a 40th anniversary edition of a great, great album called Aqualung. I'm talking with my friend and uh, Jethro Tull expert. He calls himself a Tull Skull because he's also a deadhead. His name is Bernie Kelman, and as I mentioned earlier, he's one of the... Uh, American, the only American moderator of four on the official Jethro Tull chat board. Why don't you give that address, uh, Bernie, so people can join in if they're interested in talking about Tull online? The uh, the fan site I share moderating roles on is uh, it's called the Jethro Tull Fan Forum. The web address is www.jethrotull.proboards.com. Love to have more Tull fans visit. Casual, committed. Uh, death threats, criticisms, questions. The other moderators' the names are Mad Dog, Fagan, Non Rabbit, and Bunker Fan. Non Rabbit. <laughs> you got to have a handle. Mine is Steel Monkey. Okay, now let's just talk about that for a minute. You are called Steel Monkey because you had a very interesting career for a long time. I mean, you have an interesting career now that you're a psychiatric social worker seeing people in deep crisis. But for 27 years, you were a bike messenger in San Francisco. Yep. The uh, the emergency room is a second career and a kind of apt one after uh, after convincing uptight downtown people that their emergencies were was my priority. I now uh, do it for a living in an emergency room. It's uh, it was a kind of natural segue. In 1987, there was a Jethro Tull song called "Steel Monkey." The song was kind of a tribute, a ZZ Top style tribute to steel workers, but the lyrics came out 100% relevant to bike messengers, high rise junkies, work in the thunder, work in the rain. So my then wife Sherry started calling me Steel Monkey, and it didn't take long before I had the sense to change my messenger service name from uh, EC Rider, a Grateful Dead reference for my company headquartered at Embarcadero Center, to a Jethro Tull reference, Steel Monkey. And that's what it was called until they uh, dragged me away from my bicycle kicking and screaming. And and how exactly did your career as a bike messenger end? Well, I made a promise with God that I would stop when I was 40. I told her, uh, don't let me get hurt, don't let me get doored, don't let me fall off my bike too much. And I didn't keep it. It took a few times. I relapsed biking back into bike messengering three or four times while in graduate school, after graduate school, while supporting a small family between internship and then getting some traction in my career. But uh, finally, in 2005, uh, by that time I knew I wasn't holding on to the bike, it was holding on to me. I made the big step and stopped being a bike messenger. Uh, how many times did you get doored? <clears throat> well, there's no county how many times I got doored. I got doored, floored, scored, jarred, barred. Did people do that to you on purpose? No, I don't think anyone did it on purpose, but to this day I can hear a car door unlocking from two blocks down the street when I'm riding my bike. I mean, I am sensitive. A lot of, a lot of prayers that in my mind rhyme doored with Lord. Uh, but I never got really hurt. I never, I never did not finish a day. I never was taken away in an ambulance or couldn't make it to the end of the day in my own power. I was always able to get back up again. I was very lucky. And, uh, even after stretching my term beyond my promise to God, uh, I never got hurt as a bike messenger, and for that I'm grateful. But those guys are sort of legendary for being kind of insane, aren't they? Uh, more than one of my former colleagues has presented in my emergency ward. Always really? an awkward, always an awkward situation. Literally, oh yeah. Wow. And it would be more. I mean, my bike messenger career unfolded in San Francisco. I work in Alameda County. If I was in San Francisco, I think I would... Uh, I think I know I would have a regular flow of ex-employees, colleagues, and competitors. Even in Alameda County, I've had no less than uh, four. One, one who worked for me, and uh, he's lucky I was there. I got him out of the uh, locked ward in no time flat. Does this profession attract people like intensity junkies, or I mean, you know, I mean, I I don't know much about the culture because I've never been in the business world, never employed a bike messenger. But I remember hearing, you know, like in the 80s, that they were kind of known for being crazy and uh, sometimes terrorizing people in traffic and things like that. But did it attract a particular character type? That's kind of a chicken and the egg question. It's hard to tell <laughs> if uh, some people, you know, I used to say to uh, people about bike messenger, there's, there's two kinds of people who are bike messengers. People who can't do anything else and people who can't do anything else. I was the latter. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, it's hard to tell if it attracts intense people or doing it for a while. 
sort of raises your nerves up to your skin and makes you intense, which is why I'm uh, I'm able to do my adrenaline junkie job now in the hospital and never really get burned out or too rattled. Did you really see a sort of connection between the one profession and the next? Absolutely. I mean, it was the, key, the the unifying word is emergency. Bike messengers were used in emergencies in the archaic days when business people waited in the lobby for an airplane ticket to come or court filings had to be done by a certain deadline or architect drawings had to get there before the end of the shift or locked out uh, techno peasants, officinas needed a key. Wow. Everything was an emergency. When you're a bike messenger, it's emergencies. And when you work in an emergency room, you have an emergency. And if you have four emergencies, you have to go backstage and uh, and put them in order without frustrating or angering someone for whom it's the only emergency. Uh, apparently, I gained that skill as a bike messenger. At the end of the day, everyone got their airline tickets. The court filings were done. The keys were in the right hands. The architect roles were unfurled. And somehow now I come to work and there's a lot to do and at the end of the day it's gotten done. So there is a connection and it is the adrenaline junkie uh, is what unifies it. I'm guessing you probably had any number of clients who believed they were your absolute number one priority and that you would never put anybody else's work ahead of theirs and you probably had several of those happening at the same moment. As many of them remain my closest friends, uh, we're not going to talk about that too long. We're not going to talk about that because, uh, you know, that's true. But uh, at the end of the day, I was grateful my whole life. I've never clock watched. If I've watched, if I, when I look up at a clock, whether it was on a bicycle or in an emergency room, I wish it was earlier. I've always wished that. I've never looked at the clock and wished it was Friday or 5 o'clock or later. I'd look up at the clocks downtown, and if it was 11, I'd wish it was 10.30. And the same happens where I work now. And I think, uh, you know, I think if you try to kill time, time will kill you. I've been lucky to never clock watch, and I hope to uh, keep that characteristic yeah. that bike messengers and emergency room workers share. I'm with you, man. I just think there's no excuse in the world for being bored. What time is it? You, uh, let's see, how's it going? We have all Just the time kidding. in the universe, Bernie. <laughs> we have all the time in the universe. I'm on the air until 10, and we got a bunch more stuff to do with you here, and I've got some very fresh Grateful Dead music from 1972 to share when we get finished. Now, you got on the phone with Ian Anderson, and we heard a little bit of that, but we want to go back now to the very beginning of your phone conversation with him. Tell me about this uh, interview. Well, I was nervous. I was scared, not quite trembling, not just the interview with Ian Anderson, but uh, I had to have a young friend at my side who could coach me through how to tape a phone conversation on, how you say, an iPad? No, an iPhone. It was all a little bit intimidating and scary. Uh, the publicist told me the time the phone would ring. The young friend, Harjeet, was by my side. It started out rough. I was on the ropes in no time, and... Uh, the first segment that I called from the interview, I have down on my little cheat sheet, is simply bad start. Let me start by thanking you very much for joining myself and David on the uh, birthday celebration for Aqualung. And full disclosure, you weren't our first choice. We tried to get Aqualung himself, despite your recent sighting of him in Saratoga. We were not able to reach him at the park bench, and uh, we were afraid he couldn't blow out the candles. So who wow. better to do the job than you? Okay, okay. Over I, the, I just literally walked into a hotel room and um, after a long flight, so we can crash on if you don't mind. Thank you. Oh, he didn't seem to be in a very warm and friendly frame of mind. Days and days of risking my life on a bicycle on the way to work, thinking not about traffic and stoplights, but about what I would say to Ian Anderson were quickly knocked off the map. And I retreated to a nice, simple, business-like question. I asked him about the re-release. Aqualung is going to have a big 40th anniversary to do. EMI is releasing a box set. And uh, I asked about that, and let's hear a little bit about that. It's going to come out on 1031, a very important day for my daughter anyway. And uh, let's hear Ian talk about it. How much uh, would you like to reveal about surprises, songs never heard before, radically different takes, demos, any of that, or is it just a fine-tuning of what we already know? Well, it is um, it is complete in terms of uh, all the uh, mixing and remixing, and uh, the music material is all now ready to roll. 
there was still a few last-minute additions due to uh, um, some liner note information being a little slow to come into us, um, particularly that which involves some contribution from past and present band members. Uh, but uh, it's, it's pretty much wrapped up, and um, it consists of... Uh, um, the original remastered mix um, converted flat to 94 um, 24-bit 96k digital audio and um, the new stereo remix and 5.1 surround remix which has been done by uh, Stephen Wilson of Porcupine Tree uh, he's done the remixes and uh, you know, we worked together a little bit on, on all of that, so um, that's worked out very well. And then there are 11 bonus tracks, as they're referred to, um, which consist of some studio recordings made around the same time as the Aqualung album, um, including some alternate takes and arrangements of, um, of some of the songs that... that uh, ended up on the album, albeit in slightly different versions. So um, it is quite a comprehensive collector's package. And um, I think uh, from, you know, from my perspective, having heard it all and having had a, an editorial control of, of what uh, has been finalized, it's something I'm, I'm quite pleased with and quite proud of.